Browser extensions, anonymized data, and masked payment obstacles. Welcome to the Q&A for Surveillance Report 193, where we are answering questions from our amazing patrons who allow us to make this podcast for all of you and not be beholden to any sponsors, ads, etc. You can view and join the questions on patreon.com slash surveillance pod if you want to be one of the cool kids. And in the meantime, we will jump in with our first question from Chris, who says, I'm trying to figure out what is the minimally sufficient set of LibreWolf extensions to block unwanted content, such as ads, malicious code, data collecting, etc. Currently, I'm using uBlock Origin and Privacy Badger. I'm wondering if I can replace Privacy Badger with just uBlock. What do you think? And in general, can you elaborate a little bit on the overlap in functionality and the interaction between all of these extensions that do some form of content blocking? For those who don't know, we are big proponents of having as few extensions as possible, because the more extensions you have, the more easily you can be fingerprinted. And from what I understand, the way this works is it's a cumulative effect. Websites can tell what extensions you have, but not necessarily what extensions you don't have. All right, shouldn't say not necessarily. They can't tell what you don't have. So if you use one extension, we'll say Grammarly. Millions of people use Grammarly, right? It's probably fine. But let's say you also use Grammarly and Sponsor Block. Well, not everyone who uses Grammarly uses sponsor block and not everyone who uses sponsor block uses Grammarly. So that already narrows down the pool. And then if you also use uBlock Origin, that narrows down the pool more. And if you also use Ghostery and just on and on and on and on. So ideally you want to keep it to as few extensions as possible. LibreWolf, I do believe, does come preloaded with uBlock Origin. I think that's one of their selling points. Privacy Badger in the past, it would kind of reverse track you around the web. As you're navigating different websites, it would notice what domains were called home and what resources it loaded. And if it noticed a pattern, it would start to block some of those because it was probably tracking you. They actually ended up rolling this back because they realized that this itself was kind of becoming a form of tracking because no two privacy badgers would be blocking the same stuff. And that would kind of make you stand out. So these days it actually is just a list, just like you block origin. So in answer to the first part of your question, yes, I have been told I've not seen any official research on this, but I find it very easy to believe because I know uBlock is very aggressively updated and there's a a pretty active community keeping an eye on it and offering suggestions and fixes and stuff like that. uBlock Origin, from what I've told, is significantly more powerful than Privacy Badger. So I would recommend uBlock Origin and not Privacy Badger. On my website, I actually only recommend three extensions. I recommend uBlock. I recommend Snowflake if you want to. And I recommend your browser's password manager, again, if you want to. uBlock is really only the one that I'm like, everybody should be using it. The other two are like, yeah, if you want to, there's no harm or it might be helpful. I don't recommend Privacy Badger. I don't recommend Ghostery or Disconnect or what are some of the other ones? Like there's there's a bunch of other ones that you'll see commonly. uBlock covers most, if not all of the same things those other ones do. And I think anything that uBlock doesn't cover I think is worth the risk because what you're losing in that exposure, you're gaining by not having a billion extensions. Yeah, I don't really disagree with anything Nate said at all. And I fully agree. I would probably remove Privacy Badger as well. At this point, it's just uBlock Origin and a password manager for me as well in most of my browsers. And when you use Brave, which is what I've been using lately, there's not even uBlock Origin. You can use uBlock Origin within Brave, but I find it somewhat redundant with Brave's built-in tools. But then I also have Molvad Browser, which also comes comboed up with uBlock Origin as well. I guess the only thing I'll uh, say just to add some value to this discussion beyond what Nate's already said is that you can actually change for those who don't know if uBlock Origin isn't cutting it for you, you're not very happy with the results. They don't really advertise this very well. The default that it's in is called something, it's called very easy mode or easy mode. There's a medium and hard mode in uBlock Origin that a lot of people don't know about. It's in their wiki. Pretty much medium mode is going to block a lot more things than easy mode. And then hard mode blocks a few more things than medium mode, but not much more. I think medium mode is a really good middle ground where a lot of things will actually work and you block almost as much as hard mode does. And enabling it is pretty easy. You just uh, check like I'm an advanced user. You globally block third party scripts. You globally block third party frames. I think that's pretty much it. Check their wiki for the full list. I think people really underestimate how many things uBlock Origin does. And there's so many extensions that people ask me about. And most of them you can say, oh, actually uBlock Origin does that. All right, David Johnson, why do you guys think companies get away with general claims that data they collect are anonymized since objectively that unspecified notion is meaningless? 
Well, I don't think this is an issue that's exclusive to our community. What I go back to in my head a lot when, when I think about this is I can go outside and collect some dirt and sell it as a supplement that will heal you online. And that's perfectly within the law and that's legal. And that's because supplements aren't regulated. There's no, I'm not making this up either. That's actually legal. You can do that. People do this where they just sell BS supplements. And it's the same thing here. You know, you can just say, yeah, it's anonymized, bruh. That's why that we're constantly calling for a little bit better privacy regulation. We don't think it'll fix everything, but we think that having some established rights that people can act on will prevent companies from using terms all willy nilly like this. I mean, we actually have seen some researchers that were held accountable for calling some data sets anonymized when they weren't anonymized. I don't think there was any actual repercussions for what they did, but they were at least called out by other people for not properly anonymizing user data. So again, this is one of those areas that it's very complicated. And I agree that objectively, many anonymized data sets are not actually anonymous. Many companies do this and make this claim, but there's also nothing stopping them from making the claim. That's kind of the situation. And this is why I think it's really good for people to think about kind of the more legal side of this battle as well. I don't disagree, but I'm going to take the other side of the argument, which is I think in my experience, I think a lot of this is a general lack of education. So I think, number one, a lot of people don't know that it's not anonymized. We seriously overestimate the average person. And I don't say that to be mean. If you are the average person watching this, I'm not calling you an idiot. It's just like, and I, I complained about this last week. I, I think I may have cut it out, actually. But I complained about the people who, you know, they're like, oh, it's super easy to just like fork your own copy of this program and run a script that blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, it's super easy for you, who has clearly only ever hung out with tech people for the last five to 10 years. For me and literally everyone I know, I know maybe one developer and one other person that I would be confident saying they can do some light basic coding work. I don't know a lot of hardcore developers that can like fork Rust and just create their own program. So I think a lot of it is they see the data is anonymized and they're just like, oh, okay, it's anonymized, cool. Until somebody sits them down and there goes, okay, how many people do you think are at your home for eight hours every night and at your office for eight, ever, eight hours every day. And that's the moment where they go, oh crap, this is probably really easy to de-anonymize, isn't it? They just, they don't think about this kind of stuff. A lot of people don't think about tech. They have things going on. They have kids, they have families, they have jobs. And then I think the other part where I, I still think it's education is I think a lot of people don't know that there are alternatives. Like, honestly, that's how I was before I got into privacy is I was one of those people who was like, yeah, I have nothing to hide. What's the worst that could happen? And part of it was lack of education, but part of it was also, I didn't know Signal existed, Proton existed. People don't know these things that we take as a granted that we do every day, day in and day out. And it just comes naturally to us. And it's important to remember that, that a lot of these people don't know a fraction of what we know and they're new to this and it's day one. I think that's why education is a big part of this. I also agree that laws and good defaults and things like that should be part of this as well. But a lot of people just don't think about it, don't know any better, and don't know that they can actually very, very easily and cheaply slash freely do something about it. For the record, I was I was speaking generally, not just about anonymized data specifically. Our last question comes from Cracker Barrel Biscuits, who says, I've been having issues with privacy.com lately. Over the past couple months, I've increasingly been getting purchases refunded because the cards seem to trigger companies' fraudulent purchase detection, and it's getting more and more frustrating. Have you guys personally experienced this? Anything we can do, or is it out of our control? I have experienced this a little bit, but truthfully, not enough for me to bother trying to find alternatives, which I should probably start doing. So the thing about fraudulent purchases is it's usually multiple things that triggered them. Like I found out real quick when I started using privacy.com. I'm not kidding. I used to go like hardcore tinfoil hat and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to order this and I'm going to credit it to John Doe at 123 Main Street. Obviously that's going to trigger a freaking fraud alert. So I think when you're getting a fraudulent purchase detection, there's a number of things. It could be your browser. From what I understand, and this is like CAPTCHAs too. From what I understand, it's a certain number of flags. And if you trip a certain number of flags, that's what trips the fraudulent detection. So it could be maybe you're using the Tor browser in addition to privacy.com, in addition to simple login, in addition to, in addition to, in addition to. So 
I would consider adjusting some things. Like for example, Proton VPN is a very well-known VPN. You could try maybe like Mulvad or IVPN or Portmaster, Safing Privacy Network. You could try maybe Brave instead of Mulvad browser. You know, it's it's more Chromium based, so it's less likely to to trip filters. Again, you could try a custom domain, or maybe you have a Gmail that you only use for this kind of stuff. Again, I haven't had this issue a lot. You could look into depending on what you're trying to buy. You could look into gift cards. You could look into going down in person, and I will admit I'm terrible at this. I live 15 minutes away from a Target, and I would still rather get it shipped to the PO box. <laughs> you could look into things like Apple Pay, PayPal. They're not ideal, but they'll still give you a little bit of a degree of protection, especially against like getting your card stolen or something like that. I have some stories to share here. I took notes of uh, different incidents I've stumbled on. So I'm going to start with the two bad ones and then two good ones. So I have been wanting a nice raincoat for a long time. And after doing research and asking people who actually deal with real rain, they were like, get Stitterheim. I think that's how you say it. It's a Swedish brand ordered from their site. It, you know, it's a multi hundred dollar rain jacket. I think I was the one I was getting was going to be like four hundred dollars. But these things last a, a lifetime. It's you buy it once, you never buy another one again. They would refuse to take my money. I mean, I tried three or four different times. I removed every one of my general precautions along the way. You know, I used just a regular untouched browser with no tracking. I turned off my VPN. It was the privacy.com card 100% that was triggering something. They just wouldn't even let me reach out to customer support. They just said, we can't process this transaction. So I just never bought it. And then I went to Sweden and I just bought it there in person. So my takeaway is <laughs> fly out to where they make them and buy it in person. But no, um, pretty much like I just had to say, no, I'm just not going to buy this and I have to live without it because they are not taking my money and I don't want to have to give up my credit card. And you know, it's kind of their problem. They're not accepting money I'm trying to give them, which is one of the most frustrating things is when I want to give someone money and they're just like, oh yeah, we can't take that. Second story was from Rains.com. I wanted a nice pair of gloves. Rains.com also refused to take my money. To this day, I still don't have like nice gloves that I really want. On the other hand, I was looking for uh, a face mask because I was traveling and they were still requiring face masks then. And there's a Swedish brand called Irinium. They actually flagged my transaction as well. What they did is they reached out to me by email and they said, hey, your account was flagged. Do you mind just getting back to us with some questions? Like, you know, who are you? Why do you want to use this face mask? Where do you think you're going to use it? They're BS questions. They don't actually care. They just want to make sure you're a real person. And so that was really awesome. So I sent them an email and then they actually approved the order and then they went ahead and shipped it to me. And another example is eBay. I ordered from eBay and eBay must have, I got a random call. So I tried ordering a Fujifilm X100V. I got a really good deal on a used one on eBay, bought it. And then I got a call an hour later and it's like, hey, I've been selling the X100V and actually you were marked as a suspicious purchaser of this. And normally I just, you know, remove them, but they happened to be in the area where I live. And they were like, I noticed the area and I thought it just it, something felt different about this one. So they gave me a call and they said, I just wanted to make sure you're a real person and that this and I was like, yeah, I actually I use some tools that actually like flag things because I use aliasing tools and stuff like that. And I just explained to them over the phone, but then they approved the transaction and I got the camera. So I think it's really a bummer when they don't apply a people first approach to these situations, because a lot of these companies could very easily verify if someone's real or not by just even asking for an email like, hey, this was flagged for fraud. And if they can't verify from that, then they just say, sorry, we can't verify with this information. But I don't know if I have any other value to add outside of what Nate said, outside of just sharing some of my stories and saying, yes, there are some sites that don't take it, but they're far and few between for me. I'd say 90% plus websites actually do accept it. But as always, have backups in place. See if you can get some prepaid debit cards that work online. Maybe those won't be flagged. You can always use things like Apple Pay, which will at least obfuscate on one basic level what you're using. Just to answer your question of, have you guys personally experienced this? Yes. And I guess I shared along the way my different approaches. But yeah, I kind of just don't buy the thing if I can't get it. So that was all we had this week. We had questions about browser extensions, and hopefully we were able to shed some light into that. Questions about anonymized data, kind of speculating, theorizing, philosophizing, but you know, we like these thought provoking questions sometimes and mask payment obstacles, which yes, you are not alone. We've definitely run into those and uh, I'm sure others have too. Actually, I'll make that one another one. If you guys have any suggestions of things you did to work around that worked for you, definitely leave them in the comments. You know, that whole uh, 
making each other stronger through shared knowledge kind of thing. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you to our patrons for asking questions. We appreciate you supporting the podcast. And if you would like to ask us a question and like to be one of the cool kids supporting the podcast, you can do that by joining our Q&A at patreon.com slash surveillance pod. And the link is also in the show notes if you're busy right now. Thank you again. And thank you for listening. And we will be back with Surveillance Report 194 this coming weekend.